Genesis this morning, chapter number 29. Chapter number 29. It's a long chapter. I'm going to try to preach that whole thing in just a little bit of time. Amen. Some lessons I want us to try to learn this morning, and maybe we'll just get a, a history lesson. If nothing else, we're going to be looking at Jacob. The story of Jacob is mighty rich. Amen. Historically, we know that Abraham was given the covenant promise by God that he would make of him many a great nation, and many, many people would be blessed through Abraham. So Abraham's is married. Sarah conceives Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah. Rebekah had twins. The Bible says that there were two nations within her, within her womb, and they were at odds with each other. Esau and Jacob. I may say today, the lineage of the Israelites comes through Jacob. The, the Israelites' lineage comes through Jacob. We're going to see that Christ comes through the lineage of Jacob. Esau, we will find, gives his lineage results in a totally different religion, that being Islam. But we're not going to go there today. Esau and Jacob were both born to Isaac. You will remember that whenever it came time, Esau being the firstborn, whenever it came time for Isaac to give the firstborn blessing, that Jacob, having purchased the birthright from Esau during the time when Esau was vulnerable, when it comes time for the blessing to be given, he dresses up in a way that he deceives his father, who was old at the time, and he receives the family blessing. Jacob later flees to Mesopotamia because Esau is out to get him. But he remembers a promise that Jacob, that Isaac had demanded of him. In Genesis 28 and 1, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Custom was that you married within your own family lineage to keep it pure. And so in, and so this is a story, this is a lesson on marriage. It's a lesson on deception. Some, it's a lesson on heartbreak. It, it's, it's, a, it's a rich, rich, full lesson this morning. And so we've got this picture that Jacob is going into uh, Mesopotamia. And there he seeks himself a wife. Now marriage, Jesus made it very clear. And I believe it was somewhere in Matthew, that not everyone has to be married. That not everyone is supposed to be married. I believe that was in Matthew chapter number 12. But with Jacob, marriage was not an option. It was an obligation because through him, the lineage of Jesus was to come and he knew very well uh, that he had an obligation to produce offspring. So you see the success of the covenant promises that God gave to Abraham depended on Jacob's finding a wife and with her building a family that would eventually become the people of Israel, the nation that would bring the promised redeemer into the world. Are you with me this morning? You all understand that. Marriage is a good thing. Not everybody's supposed to be married. But marriage is a good thing for those who are supposed to be married. But there's a lot of problems that are associated with marriage. Let's look at one of the problems associated with Jacob's quest to have a family as we look at Genesis chapter number 29. And I'll try to make this clear and I'll try to be concise and quick. Chapter 29 of Genesis reads like this. Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. Excuse me. Make sure I'm in the right chapter. 
and I'm not supposed to be in 30. Yeah, I'm right. I've read so many chapters in here this week. There's just sermons all in this about Jacob. I just don't know which one I'm going to preach today. Say amen. And he looked and behold, there was a well in the field and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, there, they watered the flocks and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. You got the picture. And thither were all the flocks gathered and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said to them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, Laban's daughter, cometh with the sheep. Here is Jacob by the well, where three flocks are gathered. Uh, they roll back the stone, they water the sheep, and he's asking about his uncle, and lo and behold, Rachel, Laban's daughter, comes into the picture. Alright? And verse number 6, And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. I think he's trying to brush them off right here because he won't spend time with his cousin. Just get your business done and go on. I think that's what he's trying to say there. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. And while he spake, while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she kept them. In other words, she was a sheep herder at that time. If you didn't have sons... Your daughters had to take care of your flock. Amen. And so that was equal opportunity employment, wasn't it? Huh? And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. He sure was a gentleman. You caught that, didn't you? He went over there and rolled the stone away so she wouldn't have to. He caught her eye, or he just might have been a gentleman. There is a lesson there in chivalry, guys. You know what? We still need to be polite to the fairer ladies, amen? To, to the fairer sex, if you will. We need to be polite. We need to be kind. Uh, it's all right to open the door. Uh, it's all right to do this and that, amen? Say amen with me this morning, okay? Or it's going to be a long day. And so y'all see the picture. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. He had found a kinsman. And he was so excited that he had found a kinsman, he gave her a kiss on the cheek, as was customary, and shouted, hey, happy, 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 happy. I don't know what he shouted, but he was happy because he had seen a kinsman. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. And it came to pass, when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him into the house. And he told Laban all these things. In other words, he told him about everything about his family. He may have left out the part about how he deceived his father, and how he received the blessing. He may have left out the fact that he was actually on the run from Esau. There was probably some things they left out. You know what I'm saying? Because y'all got the big picture. And Laban said unto him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? In other words, he worked with him for a whole month. In other words, he became a sheep herder right there. I think he started herding the sheep because he was helping Rebecca. I mean, because he was helping Rachel. He just wanted to spend time with Rachel. So he was out there with Rachel helping with the sheep. And Laban says, it ain't right, even though you're kin to me, it ain't right for you to be out there working for nothing. I'm going to pay you uh, to work for me. And so he said to him, tell me what shall thy wages be? And listen to this. Verse 16, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. You know this story. <coughs> Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Let me tell you something. Leah was tender-eyed. I've heard preachers say 
Johnny Cook said one time, that means she was ugly. If she was an ugly woman. Might have been the case. Really, in the Hebrew, that tender eye, what that means is that she had a disease in her eyes. And it was a disease that caused her to squint all the time from birth. And it may be that she was a little bit rough. And that she was a little ugly compared to others that didn't have that disease. I mean, listen, we all look a little odd, don't we? We all have our own features, amen? Amen, we all look a little odd. Y'all heard the story about the mama that gave birth to a son that was so ugly that the doctor slapped the mama when she looked at the boy. That was ugly. I'm just checking to see if y'all are with me. Y'all heard about the, the mama that had to tie the dog bone around their kid's neck because the kid was so ugly the dog wouldn't play with her any other way. You've heard that story too, haven't you? Uh, we know we know stories about ugly. It's all right to laugh because they ain't all of us visions of beauty. Say amen. amen. And she was ugly. She didn't look the same as everybody else. She didn't look right. She was ugly. And here was Rachel and she was just beautiful. Drop dead gorgeous. Amen. Like your bride was the day you married her. Drop dead gorgeous. Amen. Mine still is. Yeah, take that. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. It says that she was beautiful, and as well as being beautiful, she was well-favored. That meant that Jacob had a love for her. He had a special love for her. He had feelings for her that he didn't have for Leah. She was well-favored. Eighteen, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, Now, there's a deal being brokered here. How much? It's not right that you work for me for free, even though we're family. What's it going to take? I want to pay you. He's already worked a month for free. Shepherding. I think his ulterior motive was just because he wanted to spend time with Rachel. The Bible don't say that, but I imagine that's probably where it was. And so he strikes this deal. And Jacob loved Rachel. In other words, Jacob was his fell head over heels over Rachel in verse 18. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll serve you seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. I'll work for you seven years. You give me Rachel to marry. Now listen, we're talking about a day when women were treated like possessions. Do you hear me? Buying and selling the right to marry. Times are different, amen. In some parts of the country, it's still that way though. A possession to be bartered for, to be bought and sold. And that's the situation. I'll work for you seven years. Verse number 19, And Laban said, It's better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. In other words, I would rather do it the godly way and keep her in the family, in the lineage as it is, instead of letting her marry a stranger outside our family. I think it's good that you should marry her, so you stay with me seven years and I'll let you marry her. And the deal was done. Amen. Verse 20, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days. When you're in love... Man, it was worth working for her. Time flies by. Verse 21, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. The custom of the day was, on the day that you were married, your bride came out in a heavy veil and heavy garments. You really couldn't see the face of the one that you were marrying because of the veil. After the ceremony, you would take your bride into your tent, and while the bridal, while the, the, the bridal party, all those that were in a tent uh, that were there, stood around having their little party, you consummated the marriage. 
Everybody say amen. We're adults. Okay? And for seven days, of course, after the consummation, the marriage party went home. But for seven days, the bride and the groom were treated like king and queen and were not expected to do anything except honeymoon. My honeymoon is still going on, so it lasted more than seven days. Boy, I'm just raking them up now, ain't I? <laughs> So you understand. A week of consummation. Consummating that marriage. And Laban gathered together in verse 22 the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. In other words, he went in and he consummated the marriage. Not realizing it was Levin instead of Rachel. Why is that? Maybe he had too much wedding party in him to realize the difference. Maybe he had drank the sacramental wine too much that day. Maybe he was just so headstruck in love. That who, who knows? I don't know why. That he couldn't tell the difference. But that's pretty wild to me. Uh, geez, where am I? And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him and he went into her and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zipha his maid for a handmaid. And it came to pass, behold, in the morning uh, it was Leah and he said to Laban, What is that thou hast done to me? Did I not serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore? You've beguiled me. I worked seven years and look what you've done. And Laban said, I must not, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. You understand that. Now, Laban made a promise, but he didn't say that he would give Rachel to him first. He did say, I'll let you have Rachel. But maybe in his mind, Laban knew that if it come time that, Laban, that his ugly daughter wasn't married, that he was going to pawn off her on Jacob. It's a possibility. Amen. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve me yet another seven years. In other words, you go be with her for the honeymoon week at the end of that week. You can marry Rachel, and then you can work seven years for her. You got the picture, amen. And Jacob did so, fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, for his wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, Belia's handmaid, to be her maid, and he went into Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet another seven years. And so what we have found out it's during his journey to Mesopotamia, Jabel meets Rachel at a well. I believe it was love at first sight. Um, they realized that they were kin folks. And in the ancient East, family ties were so strong and visiting relatives was so important that it, that it meant that you, that you just opened your home to your relatives even if you had never met them. You were hospitable with them for at least a week to help them along their way. And so that's exactly what happened. Unbelievers um, might call this meeting a coincidence, but born again believers see this as a divine appointment that Jacob finds uh, 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 Laban and goes to work with Laban. Jacob is on the run from Esau, all right? He finds Laban, his kid folk, so he stays with him. And we see the Lord uh, 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 and Jacob deceives, uh, or Laban deceives Jacob. Kind of reminiscent of Jacob's deception of Isaac, wasn't it? Remember how whenever Isaac went in uh, uh, to give his, was ready to give Esau his blessing, and Jacob dressed up with the, with the wool and everything on him to deceive his father? I've heard said what goes around comes around. And that's exactly what's happened. He got deceived in much the same way, didn't he? he? Isn't that something? He got deceived in much the same way. 
And so during the early days in Lebanon's home, Jacob was just happy uh, to be there. He didn't realize that Lebanon was a master of deception. And in the excitement of a moment, a time of decision involving, involving accepting a full-time job and being engaged to a beautiful woman, Jacob must have said, life is good. I'll work seven years for the love of, this, uh, for the love of your daughter uh, so that she'll be my bride. Notice Laban, I said, made no promise that he would give Rachel to Jacob at the end of those seven years. He only agreed to give Rachel for his wife. You know, the devil is in the details. Have you ever heard that? The devil is in the details. There was a little bit left out there. What, why did Jacob not know? I do not know. But it ended up that Jacob had two marriages within a week. And he had two weeks of marriage celebration. And he was indebted another seven years. Now Jacob protested the way that Laban treated him and Rachel. But he meekly accepted his lot and went back to work for another seven years. Amen. Now, the Jews looked upon parenthood as a stewardship before God. In other words, the Jews believed that you were expected to have children to honor God. Are you with me so far? I'm giving you a great big introduction just to make a little point at the end. God honored Jacob by making him a father of the 12 tribes of Israel. How many of you realize that this morning? Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Unfortunately, what got him in trouble is it took him four different women that were involved in building his family. It took four women to have his 12 children. Now, polygamy in the Old Testament, I'm not even going to try to explain that. That's God's dealings. In the New Testament, we see Jesus uh, references that it's good that man have one wife and that woman have one husband. And so we live in a, in a non-polygamy society in the U.S. of A. You can only be married to one person at a time. Y'all say amen. And God help those that think they can handle more than one. Y'all say amen. Hmm? I've said all of that just to get us to this point. God honored Jacob by making him a father of the 12 tribes of Israel, even though it took four different women. His family would create uh, for Jacob one problem after another problem after another problem. And we're going to look at one of those today. Rachel, the Bible says, was barren. That means that she was unfruitful. That means that she could not have children. It was an honor for a man to have children. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, great is a man that has many arrows, uh, 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 many arrows in his container. It's talking about great is a man that has many children. He is well thought of. He is well favored. And so we understand that it was, a, it was an embarrassment if a woman could not have children. And so here... Uh, Rachel was barren and she was unfruitful and she couldn't have any kids and, and, and here he was married to two women and he didn't have any children at all. I want you to notice as we read the rest of this chapter very quickly that Leah, uh, we're going to explore Leah's situation because Leah gave him some children. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, y'all with me verse 31? He opened her womb but Rachel was barren. Now that word hated does not mean that he was physically abusing her. It does not mean that he was abusive towards her. It doesn't imply active physical abuse. It simply means that he loved Rachel more and he gave Rachel more attention. The fact that Leah bore Jacob six sons and a daughter shows us that he was fulfilling his marital duties towards her. But Jacob worked 14 years for wives, but only one bore him children. And because of that, Leah says, I will get his affection one way or another. Leah knew that Jacob loved Rachel more than her or favored Rachel more than her. She knew that. She knew that she was married to him under a great cloud of deception. She knew that. She probably expected that Jacob would be a little bitter towards her and that she would never have the same place that Rachel had in his heart. And so what she tries to do is what we try to do in life in a different circumstance is she tried to find a way to gain his approval and that was to bear him children. 
And she thought if I can just do something that Rachel can't do, that what I can do is gain that favor that he's showing her. I'll take it away from her. He'll love me more. He'll accept me more. He'll appreciate me more than her if I can just do something that she can't. I want to tell you right now, the problem with a lot of us is we are vying for people's attention sometimes so much that we're willing to do almost anything to gain that attention. I've known of husbands and wives that have been married for years and they're having problems and, and they're fussing and they're fighting and it looks like the man is about to leave the woman and one day the woman shows up and she says, hey, I'm pregnant. And she thinks in her mind, now you're going to have to stay with me and now you're going to have to love me and now we're going to have to build a home together and she feels like she's got him right where she wants him and now he'll never leave me. I've got him. I'll get his attention. I'll get his affection through this child. That's dangerous. Say amen. Uh, I want to get on some touchy subjects. Y'all called me to preach, and so I'm just going to do it. Amen. And so she says, if I have a son, if I bear him children, I'll steal away his affection. There are so many times we're willing to do almost anything to get the attention of someone else that we do it, and we do it with the wrong motives altogether. She bears a child. Firstborn name was Reuben. She named him Reuben. Reuben's name means see a son. And, and Leah probably, let me keep reading. Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction now, there for my husband will love me, and she named him Reuben, see, a son. And certainly she thought that that would bring the love of her husband. You see, I have given you a son. I have made you proud. I have given you honor in society. I have given you that that Rachel has not given you. I've given you something that no one else has given you. I have given you a son to carry on your namesake. Hey, listen, I am well deserved of your favor more than Rachel. Y'all love me more more because I've given you more. Now that's the attitude that we have in so many areas of life. And then look what happens. She conceived again. Hey, listen. He didn't love her. He didn't, he didn't show her any more favor than before she bare him Reuben. And so she comes up and she says, I'll have another, son, I'll have another child. And she says, she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son. And she called his name Simeon. Simeon, the name means one who hears. Now let me tell you what that tells me. One who hears. That tells me that Leah had been talking to God and she had been complaining about her misery. She had been talking to God. She was taking her problem to the right source. She was taking it to God. She was complaining to God that she wasn't getting the love, that she wasn't giving the attention, that she wasn't giving the affection. She's taking it to God and she's saying, God, you got to do something. You got to do something. Give me another child. I have got to get his attention. And so she bore again and there was Simeon. The Bible says... Verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Finally, I've given him three sons. I have given him three children. Finally, he's going to love me more than Rachel. Finally, he's going to give me that attention. He, I'm going to have what I want because I have given him so much. That's her attitude. Are you with me this morning? I have given him three children. Surely to goodness now, he's going to give me all of his attention because doggone it, I deserve it since I've given him so much. The name Levi means attached. Leah's still hoping that Jacob would love her for the sons that she bore him. Must have been painful. Leah knew that Jacob was only doing his duty. And not sharing affection. But still she bared him children. And here's Rachel with no children. And here's Leah with all these kids. And she's thinking, he ought to love me more. He ought to love me more. He ought to and she's complaining to God. And she's taking matters into her own hand. And she's trying to make 
a way to cause, to force her husband to love her more. Man, there are times when men and women will go to this crazy, extraordinary ways for the affection of someone else. They'll do things that are ungodly. They'll do things that are, are despicable. They'll do things that are, not, that are not profitable at all. Listen, we'll sell out for the affection of somebody else. You try to get the favor of your boss man, it's hard to say what you suck up. You've heard that word. You suck up to your boss man. You talk nice about him. You try to do these little extra things just to get noticed. And you hope that he sees that you're working harder than the other guy so that he'll favor you more than the other guy. Are you with me this morning? Please tell me that some of this is sinking in. Amen. Friendships. you got a friendship. There are several of you in the friends. You go out in a group. You go to a disco or whatever. And you're trying everything that you can do to be, to be the best light friend at the party. Yes. You want attention. You want affection. Do anything for it. Levi, it meant attached. And so Leah is still hoping that Jacob's going to love her because of all the sons that she bore. But nothing happens. Jacob's not loving her anymore, and so she continues on. The Bible tells us she continues on. The Bible does. It says that she conceived again. Excuse me. Yes. Huh? And she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now, well, I praise the Lord. And therefore she called his name Judah, and she stopped bearing kids. What does this tell us? Well, by the time the birth of her fourth son seemed to bring a new joy in her life. She named him Judah. That means praise. So you know what happens in the life of this story? Jacob is running. He finds Laban, falls in love with Rachel. He is deceived by Laban, marries Leah, and then has to commit himself to, to, to pay off Rachel. And he's got himself two wives, and one's barren and one's not. And he's showing the favor to the unbarren one and not the favor of Leah. And so Leah sets out. She says, I'll gain his love. I'll gain his confidence. I'll gain his all by having him children. And she has a child, and there's nothing changes in his attitude. She has another child, nothing changes his attitude. She has another child, nothing changes his attitude. And she's doing everything she can to get his attention. And you know what she finally realized, I believe? That God's attention is more important to her than anybody's attention. Because she named that child Judah. That means praise. And she knew that name meant praise. You know what she said? I'm finally going to stop getting his affection. I'm finally going to stop trying to get his attention. And I'm just going to love on God. And I'm going to love the Lord who has blessed me with his children. And let things be as they may. And from that day forward, she did not worry that, 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 that Rachel was more favored than she was. It, are you here? She still had more children after this. But from that day forward, she decided having a relationship with God that is thriving uh, uh, and fruitful is far more important than having all the friends in the world, let's say. It's far more important than having all the wealth in the world, let's say. That's far more important than having... That, listen, she realized instead of complaining to the Lord about her unresponsive husband, she was now praising the Lord for his blessings. Amen. She says in chapter 29, verse 35, This time I will praise the Lord. Man, I said all that to get to this point. Who, listen, are you trying to get people's approval? I mean, what lengths will you go to try to get somebody's approval in your life? How much compromise will you make to try to get somebody's attention? You'll try one thing with this. You'll try another thing with somebody else, and you still, again, something else with somebody else, and you're just, try, you're just trying to get approval anywhere you can. We go around trying to make things better, but at the same time, the things around us are still ugly. Now you see, Leah was not fair to look upon. I've heard it said that Leah was ugly. And in the midst of her trying to make her situation better, she was still ugly. And in the midst of trying to make her situation better, the things around her were still ugly. 
And she finally just gave up and said, you know what? It's more important to please God. And she started pleasing God. Johnny Cook once said, it's better to give God ugly praise than to give God no praise at all. So if all you got is ugly praise in an ugly situation, just praise God. Amen? And stop trying to please the world and start trying to please God. Amen? And that's the message of the day. A little history, a little humor. I didn't, Look, I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm certainly not trying to bring no disrespect to the Bible. But you can see Rachel was favored and Leah was not favored as much. I'm glad that with God we are all favored. Amen. And with God we all stand. The foot of the cross is level ground. And when God sees us, He sees us through Christ. When He sees us as part of His family, and praise God, we are heirs and joint heirs, and we have been adopted so that we are His children. And listen, when you had more children in that day, the greater your honor. God is honored by all of His spiritual children. And that's the message for today. Amen. 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 Sister, you come and lead us. Frank's got an invitation. So whatever the invitation, whatever your need this morning, are you trying to get somebody's approval? Are you trying to gain somebody's attention? Listen, the message of the day is more important to do things God's way and to try to find His favor and then let those that favor you favor you but never compromise in the sight of God.